Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Mario Ritter in Washington. Every day on this program, we bring you news from and about the United States and the world. This is what you will hear on today's program. You will hear a report on growing tomatoes by Faith Perlow and Jill Robbins. Then Brian Lynn presents the science report. After that, we hear a report from John Russell. Then listen for our National Parks series. But first, this report. The South American country of Chile likes to present itself as a worldwide leader on climate change. Nearly 22% of Chile's electricity comes from solar and wind energy production centers. That is a higher percentage than the United States, with 13%. The world average is 10 percent. In 2008, Chile was also one of the first countries to declare a target for renewable energy. However, imported natural gas, a fossil fuel like coal and oil, has continued because of a favorable supply deal won from the government. Marcelo Mena is a former environment minister for Chile. He leads Global Methane Hub. The non-profit group aims to reduce methane emissions around the world. Mena said natural gas is basically methane. They're actually hindering the power that we can deliver from renewable energy, Mena told the Associated Press. It's been more of an opposition towards 100% renewable target. Mena said renewable energy is being pushed out by fossil fuels in northern Chile. At the same time, in the south of Chile, there is a big lack of natural gas for heating, and people are heating themselves with wood and choking on it, said Mena. The shock that led to the development of renewable energy in Chile came in the mid-2000s. At that time, Argentina greatly reduced gas exports to Chile to serve its own market. Chileans had limited electricity, and power outages happened a lot. Chile receives some of the most consistent sunshine in the world, especially in the northern Atacama Desert. So the country sought investment in solar and wind projects. Chile requires electricity companies to offer a minimum amount of renewable energy. Developers built hundreds of solar and wind plants. They also built systems that get energy from the Earth's heat, called geothermal plants. These energy centers were placed throughout the country, which stretches 4,300 kilometers from north to south. The government also invested in fossil fuel plants. Natural gas importers and owners of gas plants successfully argued that the power grid must take their electricity. The importers must pay for gas under international contracts, whether they need it or not. Under government regulations, 
they can declare electricity from gas imports forced gas. That means electricity produced from gas is favored in the power market, which also supports renewables. Anna Leah Rojas leads the Chilean Association of Renewable Energies and Storage. She said the rule is a loss for the environment and for the energy transition. Another result of forcing electricity produced from gas into the market is that it lowers electricity prices for all providers. Alfredo Solar is a solar plant supervisor. He said, I have worked in solar plants that, for example, were in default because the market price was much lower than what was projected. The term default means that they could not pay their debts. Solar providers, he said, operate without contracts and depend on market prices. Last year, the Chilean government changed the rules for natural gas providers. Their electricity still enters the power grid at a reduced price, but it is not supposed to displace renewable energy. Supporters of renewables in Chile say the changes are not enough. Large electricity storage systems are too costly to be widely used in Chile, said Daniel Salazar. He is a former executive director of Chile's Northern Power Grid, who is now with the business advice firm Energy. He said, Gas remains a low-cost way to deal with the nation's energy problems. By 2030, solar producers could provide 30% of all electricity in Chile. The Association of Power Generators says that will make it the nation's largest source of power. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Tomatoes are the most popular crop among American home gardeners. Garden writer Jessica Damiano says there are many good reasons to grow your own tomatoes. Just the smell of homegrown tomatoes, Damiano says, will remind you of summer. A major benefit of growing your own tomatoes is variety. If you visit a garden center, you will find seeds and small starter plants. For yellow tomatoes, purple tomatoes, huge tomatoes, and even very small tomatoes. There are kinds you simply cannot find at a local food store. Damiano loves tomatoes. In fact, she created and hosted the Great Long Island Tomato Challenge while working for a local newspaper in the state of New York. The gatherings of people who love tomatoes, or tomato files, continued for 13 years. One tomato that was entered into the challenge weighed more than 2.3 kilos. Damiano also got to meet and speak with the competitive tomato growers who raised the winning fruits. It did not take long for her to notice some common practices among them. Tomatoes are not difficult to grow. The most important things are to give the plants plenty of water, well-draining soil, 
heat, and light. It is best to grow tomatoes in a place that receives at least six hours of sunlight each day. Removing weeds will keep pests and diseases away while giving the plants enough nutrients to produce fruit. Tomatoes grow best in soil with a pH level between 6.0 and 6.8. If the pH reading is lower than 6.0, you can add about two cups of dolomitic lime into the soil for each plant. Make sure to mix it deep into the soil, down to around 30 centimeters. If you want to grow really big tomatoes, try following these seven tips from expert growers. 1. Select tomato seeds with names like Big Zack, Porterhouse, Rhode Island Giant, or Bull's Heart. They are all genetically designed to produce large fruit. 2. Start seeds early indoors and replant them into larger containers several times before moving them outdoors. Plant them deeply each time, removing leaves from the bottom one-third of plants and burying stems up to the next set of leaves. This will produce stronger plants. 3. Remove new flowers that develop at the top of the plant when older fruits near the bottom begin to grow. This will force the plant to produce fewer but larger tomatoes. 4. Pay close attention. Observe the plants daily for pests and diseases. React quickly to prevent problems. 5. Remove the small growths where the plant's stems and branches meet. This will prevent them from taking away nutrients and shading developing fruit under them. 6. Cut back or prune the plants to keep only one main branch instead of letting them develop into a shorter, wider shrub. 7. Finally, water, fertilize, and weed. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Faith Perlow. Researchers have developed a new method for making changes to the genes of insects called cockroaches. The scientists said the method could be an important step. They said it could help remove barriers to researching and changing or editing genes of all kinds of insects. The technology used in the new method is called CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR tool makes it possible for scientists to change DNA by adding or taking away parts of the DNA of living cells. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a main substance that carries genetic information in the cells of living things. CRISPR technology has been used to carry out research and create possible treatments for genetic diseases affecting humans. In 2020, two women were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing the CRISPR-Cas9 tool. The method has also been used to target and change genes in animals and insects. Last year, for example, scientists announced they had used the CRISPR-Cas9 method to block the ability of mosquitoes to identify human targets. The scientists involved in the new study also used the CRISPR-Cas9 tool but they developed a new process to improve their research for use with many kinds of insects. 
In the past, researchers performing gene editing on insects injected genetically edited materials directly into developing embryos. But the new method involves injecting the materials into female adults as early eggs are still developing. The researchers call their new method direct parental and describe it as simple and efficient. Takaki Daimon of Japan's Kyoto University helped lead the research and was the lead writer of the study. He said in a statement that with the new method, researchers have been freed from the annoyance of egg injections. Diamond added that the process his team invented simplifies and speeds up gene editing in insects. We can now edit insect genomes more freely and at will. In principle, this method should work for more than 90% of insect species, he said. The results recently appeared in the publication Cell Reports Methods. The researchers said cockroaches and many other kinds of insects have unusual reproductive systems. This limits the way the CRISPR editing technology can be used on them. Past attempts that sought to edit the genes of cockroaches failed. The team said it solved the problem by creating a method that does not require CRISPR materials to be injected into early embryos. The result successfully created so-called knockout cockroaches. The term knockout is used by scientists to describe organisms that have had all or part of a gene removed or inactivated by genetic engineering. In addition, the scientists tested their method on red flower beetles. Those experiments produced results more than 50% of the time, the team reported in the study. The researchers said their results demonstrated that the new method can be used in research involving many kinds of insects. But they noted the process will not work on some kinds of insects that have more complex reproductive systems, such as fruit flies. The team said their method does not require costly equipment, complex experimental setups, or highly skilled laboratory workers. Diamond said, These problems with traditional methods have plagued researchers who wish to perform genome editing on a wide variety of insect species. I'm Brian Lynn. She has four limbs, expressive eyes, and likes to walk through greenery in New York City. Happy is an Asian elephant. But can she also be considered a person? That question was before New York's highest court this week. The case involves the Non-Human Rights Project and the Bronx Zoo. Supporters at the Non-Human Rights Project say Happy is an independent being with complex thinking abilities. They want her moved from what they say is a prison-like space she lives in at the zoo. They argue that she should have that right under law as a person. 
The Bronx Zoo, where Happy lives, argues Happy is neither illegally imprisoned nor a person. The zoo says Happy is a well-cared-for elephant, respected as the magnificent creature she is. Happy has lived at the Bronx Zoo for forty-five years. The State Court of Appeals heard arguments over whether she should be released through a special proceeding, known as a habeas corpus proceeding. It is a way for people to fight illegal imprisonment. The Non-Human Rights Project wants Happy moved from the zoo to a larger area. Project attorney Monica Miller told the Associated Press ahead of the court arguments that Happy has an interest in exercising her choices and deciding who she wants to be with and where to go and what to do and what to eat. Miller added, and the zoo is prohibiting her from making any of those choices herself. The group said that in 2005, Happy became the first elephant to pass a self-awareness test. Happy repeatedly touched a white X on her forehead as she looked into a large mirror. The zoo and its supporters warned that a win for the non-human rights project could open the door to more legal actions about animals, including pets and other animals in zoos. Happy was born in the wild in Asia in the early 1970s. She was captured and brought as a one-year-old to the United States. Happy arrived at the Bronx Zoo in 1977 with Grumpy, another elephant. Grumpy died twenty years ago after a fight with two other elephants. Happy now lives in an area next to the zoo's other elephant, Patty. The zoo's attorney argued in court filings that Happy can swim, eat, and do other behaviors that are natural for elephants. NRP's lawyers say no matter how Happy is being treated at the zoo, her right to bodily liberty is being violated. If the court recognizes Happy's right to that liberty under habeas corpus, she must be released, they argue. Judge Jenny Rivera asked Miller about NRP's position on human-animal relationships. So does that mean that I couldn't keep a dog? Rivera asked. I mean, dogs can memorize words. Miller said there is evidence showing elephants are more mentally complex. Lower courts have ruled against the NRP, and the group has failed to win in similar cases, including one involving a chimpanzee named Tommy. Opponents hope the NRP's series of court losses continues with the New York court. The court's decision is expected in the coming months. At least one animal rights supporter suggests a court decision will not change society's view of animal use. Rutgers Law School professor Gary Francioni, who is not involved in the case, said that would require a wider cultural change. I'm John Russell. And now, our National Parks series. Yellowstone National Park became America's first national park in 1872. The National Park Service was formed 44 years later in 1916. Yellowstone, which is mostly in the state of Wyoming, is considered an example of the success of the national park system. Humans have been present in Yellowstone for more than 11,000 years. The first organized exploration of the area, which lies close to the continental divide of North America, took place 
in 1870. Those first organized explorers must have seen right away how special the land was. Yellowstone contains beautiful mountains, deep canyons, lakes, and rivers. The name Yellowstone comes from the river running through the area. At first known as Rock Yellow River, it became known as the Yellowstone River. Yellowstone is host to many different species of plants. However, the park is most special because of what lies underneath it. It sits on top of an ancient super volcano known as the Yellowstone Caldera. The caldera is 48 by 72 kilometers and it remains an active volcano. It is believed that the last time the volcano exploded or erupted was one half million years ago. The area has had three major eruptions in the last three million years. Experts say it may erupt again in another 1,000 to 10,000 years. But each year, there are thousands of earthquakes at Yellowstone. Most are too small to be felt by people visiting the park. Yellowstone is filled with the beauty of many thermal or hot water springs. Of all the geothermal places in the world, half are in Yellowstone. In places of geothermal activity, hot water and gases are trapped under the Earth's crust. In places like Yellowstone, they rush to the surface in the form of hot water and steam to form geysers. There are more geysers and hot springs in Yellowstone than anywhere else on Earth. The most famous geyser is Old Faithful. It erupts about every hour or hour and a half. The eruption can last from one and a half minutes up to five minutes. The amount of hot water it expels in that time can be as much as 31,000 liters or more. In addition to its beauty and wonder, Yellowstone is an animal sanctuary. It is home to the largest group of wild animals in the lower 48 United States. As you travel through the park, you can sometimes see them in their natural habitat and hear their calls to mate and defend themselves. Listen to this elk's bugle. There is still a Wild West in America, and its name is Yellowstone. I'm Dorothy Gundy. That's our program for today. I'm Mario Ritter, reporting from Washington. For all of us here at VOA Learning English, thanks for spending some time with us today. Join us tomorrow for another Learning English program from the Voice of America.